there are so many people here today, and there are so many people that I run into on a regular basis that feel like they can just do life on their own. I got this. I don't need any help. I got God and me, and we're good. But the reality is when we do life on our own, what, what, what happens? It's like we end up flying around and we just keep crashing into trees and we just keep on living in frustration. And quite honestly and quite frankly, we're not even much of a threat to the enemy. We are an easy target for the enemy. Is there anybody in here that's just tired of the enemy just constantly winning out in life? Anybody else just sick and tired of like that, that defeated feeling that just kind of hangs over us as we go through our day and go through our life. Wouldn't you love to be able to, to turn the tables and to be able to experience some victory? I don't know about you, but that's, that's where I'm at. And I've got good news for you. I don't have good news for you. The Bible's got good news for you. We are better together. The title of the message this morning is Better Together. I don't know if you realize this or not, but the day that you got saved... The day that you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you became a part of something that is so much bigger than yourself. Something that's larger than life even. You became part of the church. And you know what the Bible refers to the church as? The body of Christ. You came to church today. And in some ways, it's, it's kind of unfortunate that we say we go to church because we often associate church with a building. Can I tell you, the church is so much more than a building. You are the church. If Jesus is your savior, I am the church. We are a part of a living, breathing body, the body of Christ. We are a living organism. Do you understand this morning that the church, the body of Christ, it's the presence of God on earth. We talk about being the, the hands and feet of Jesus. We are his, his visible representation. We are the vehicle that he uses to show this world who he is. You are a part of something incredible. You are a part of something great. If you remember the beginning of Romans chapter 12 to last week, by the mercies of God... By the mercies of God, we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice. We are called to reasonable service, a life of reasonable service. And that life of reasonable service, guess where it begins and guess who it begins with? Each other, one another. All right, now last, last week I messed this up. I said, everybody look behind you, look to the side of you, and nobody was looking at anybody, okay? So I'm fixing it this week. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at somebody that's not in your family, that's close to you, and I want you to look them right in the eye and say with all sincerity, we are better together. All right, will you do that this morning? Go ahead. There we go. Now tell those same people, hey, Tell them, so the same people, introduce yourself if you don't know them. Tell them what your name is real quick, too. We need to know each other. If we're going to be better together, we need to know who we are. All right, that's good. I love it. Okay. Now, hopefully that will continue on after we leave here. But the reason why I do that this morning is because we've got to realize we belong to each other. If you're saved and a child of God, we, we belong to the church. We belong to one another. We minister to each other. We need each other. You understand this morning? We, we need each other. God did not create us to do life on our own. And when we are united and when we are one body and when we are one family, yes, God can use us to defeat the enemy. God can use us to give us some great victories in our lives. We are better together. So we got some practical things that we're going to talk about and go over today. So let's just jump right in. If we're going to be better together, we've got to, first of all, we've got to think right. We've got to think right. Everybody look at verse three with me in Romans chapter 12. And I'm going to stop and have you fill in the blank where I stop. Okay. So everybody got it? Following along with me, verse three, the Bible says, for I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to of himself more highly than he ought to, but to soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man in the measure of faith. All right, so he just gets done challenging us to live a life of reasonable service, present our bodies as living sacrifices, to renew our minds. And the first place that he starts is we got to change our thinking 
Or more importantly, we've got to think right. I'm just going to give you some practical things that he lays out in here. That where that all starts is we've got to be humble. We've got to think humbly. The first job of the, remo- the renewed mind is to obliterate pride. You know what thinking highly of yourself is? This is really simple. Thinking highly of yourself is just simply thinking beyond what is appropriate. Thinking beyond what is appropriate. I brought some Legos with me today. I got a bunch of Legos in here, and I pulled this one out of my pocket because this is the exact one I wanted. I think this is going to help us today just really drive these points home, but wouldn't it be kind of crazy if this Lego started thinking too highly of himself, and this Lego was like, you know what? I really am a pretty amazing Lego. Look at how perfectly rectangular of a shape I am in. Look at how shiny my gray is, man. I got a nice shiny gray. There's nothing dull about this one right here. Look at how perfectly rounded these circles are. I mean, wouldn't it be kind of crazy if this Lego just started just thinking a little bit highly of himself, a little bit more of himself than he ought to think? You would all look at this and say, dude, you're one of the most basic, boring parts of the Lego set that there is. I mean, this is like got six circles on. I mean, this is just a building block. It's just, there's nothing great about this. This is just ordinary. It's just significant. It's just a piece of Lego, right? Would you understand this morning? Well, actually, let me go a little bit further than that. Maybe you got a lot going for you. Maybe you're like this really fancy car right here. This is a better Lego piece right here. This is a Lego. And maybe you got some talents and abilities and you got a lot going for you and and people can see those talents and abilities. Or maybe you're like this tree, And people just like to be around you because you just give shade, man. You just are one of those people that just, you make others laugh. And you're just a presence that people like to be around you. Maybe you're like this cool little wheelbarrow right here. And you just are, you just get stuff done. Man, you just are a worker and a server. Your boss loves you because you just can perform. And you can just knock things out of the park. Or maybe you're this really cool door. Not because you're closed off, but because you're open. And you share your feelings with others. And again, you're that warm, inviting presence. The bottom line is, hey, we all come in different shapes and sizes. But here's the question. All alone, any of these things, all alone, what are they really? Even this right here, if it's not part of that really cool Lego set, whether it's a garage or a cool village or whatever, what is this? It's nothing. It's just all alone, and it's not going to reach the fullness. God created you to be a part of something greater and bigger than yourself. Hey, thinking highly of yourself, thinking beyond what is appropriate can also look like something different, too. It can also be this piece of Lego right here that looks at themselves and says, I really am nothing. I'm just average and ordinary. There's nothing about me that stands out. There's nothing about me that shines. Can I tell you that is the exact opposite of how we should think about ourselves? You are a part of something bigger and greater than yourself. You are created in the image and likeness of God. He designed you exactly how you are, and you are made to fit perfectly into something that is bigger and greater. So think humbly. The next thing that he says in that verse is to to be sober, not to think of ourselves more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. To think soberly carries the idea of being in your right mind, exercising sober judgment in relation to yourself. You know how to exercise sober judgment into relation to yourself? By the mercies of God. Where would you be if it wasn't for the mercies of God? You know what's beautiful about the Christian life? Do you know what's beautiful about coming to know Christ as your Savior? We all came the same way. We all came broken. We all came desperate. We all came guilty. We all came in need of a Savior. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Nobody is greater. Nobody is better. We are all condemned. We are all guilty. We are all sinners. And in Jesus Christ, we all found the same life that transforms everything. So think soberly. Think The mercies of God. Because who and where would we be if it wasn't for the mercies of God? Hey, be realistic. Be realistic. He goes on in that verse. He says, don't think too highly of yourself. Think soberly. And then he says this, according as God hath dealt to every man. What do you pride yourself in this morning? What do you pride yourself in? You pride yourself in your family? Do you pride yourself in your character? You're a person of character. Do you pride yourself in your work ethic? 
You pride yourself in your career and your job and your ability to get things done, your ability to bring people together. Do you pride yourself in your, in your net worth and how much money you have in your bank account? Do you pride yourself in your wife and in your children or in your family or whatever the case may be? Here's the real question. What do you have that's not been given to you? You may go out there and think, well, I've worked hard for this and I've earned this and I've scraped it all together. Can I tell you, everything that you have, everything that you are, is still a gift from your creator and your maker and your God in heaven. And everything that you have has been given you according to his grace and his mercy. Everything you have could also be taken away from you. So be realistic. And then the last thing is be useful. Be useful according as God hath dealt to every man. Paul's about to go somewhere, okay? So all of these things, man, we got to think humbly, not to think of ourselves in an inappropriate. We got to think soberly by the mercies of God. We got to be realistic and recognize that everything we are and everything that we have comes from God because the whole purpose for all of this is he wants you to think, I'm useful. We're going to be talking about spiritual gifts that are coming up here. Spiritual gifts. Do you know that when you got saved, God gave to every single believer here this morning, every single child of God, God gave you a gift. God gave you a spiritual gift. Yes, you have a spiritual gift. All of us do. And we're not just talking about natural abilities here. We are talking about spiritual gifts, spiritual abilities. Natural abilities help in natural ways and natural areas. But spiritual gifts and spiritual abilities Help in spiritual ways that really matter. So the gifts that God's given you, they're able to help produce faith and hope and love and the things that really matter in the lives of other people. And so be useful. This is where he's going. So think humbly, be sober, think soberly, think realistically, think usefully. And here's the practical application. If we're going to think right, you know what we got to think? We got to think Christ. Think Christ. Look at how he ends that verse. It says, according as, God, as, according as God hath dealt to every man the, what are those last three words? Everybody out loud together. The measure of faith. The measure of faith. God has dealt to every man according to the measure of faith. Faith in what? Faith in Christ. Our faith is in Christ. And just like your faith in Christ made you a brand new creation in Christ, okay? Your faith in Christ made you a brand new creation in Christ. Your faith in Christ also enables you to be used by God in a supernatural way. So if you're gonna be humble, if you're gonna be sober, if you're gonna be realistic, if you're gonna be useful, you know what we gotta do? We gotta think little about ourselves and much about him. I love that song that we just sung. I I didn't know all the words. That's the first time I heard it. And you know what that song said? Night and day, day, I'm not even gonna do that. Why am I trying to sing again? Okay, I messed it up. I don't even know the tune that good yet, but night and day, day and night, night and day, day and night. I liked how it repeated itself over and over again. Night and day, day and night, night and day, day and night, because sometimes life feels like that, right? The monotony, you get up every day, you go to bed every night, you get up the next day, you repeat the process over and over and over again. And you know what we need to do? Think less of me, and more of him, and repeat that process over and over and over again, because the measure of your faith in Christ can grow, and it can increase, and the less we think of ourselves, and the more we think about being useful to others, and the more we think about the mercies of God, the more that our gifts can grow, and by the way, the measure of faith, where does the measure of faith stop? I mean, I don't, Jesus died, and what did he do when he died? He rose again, right? There is an omnipotent, unlimited power that possibilities of what God can do in you and through you are endless. If we're not thinking of ourselves, but we're thinking of Christ, if we're going to be better together, we've got to think right. It's not about me. It's about Christ. It's about others. Secondly, we've got to think big. We've got to think big. If we're going to be better together, we've got to think big. All right, everybody look at verses 4 and 5 with me. Look at verse 4. It says, okay, I'm going to have you fill in blank, so be ready, okay? You all ready? Everybody with me? All right, here. I'm not convinced. Is anybody with me? <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> there we go. All right, verse 4. For as we have, what are the next two words? 
many members in one body, and all, next word, have not the same office. So we, next two words, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one, finish the verse with me, members one of another. You know what we are? We're many members. If we're going to think big, you know that the first thing that we need to do is we need to think big differences. Big differences. There's a lot of big differences in the church. The early church was very diverse. One of my favorite early churches is the church at Philippi. Man, there's a great story in the church at Philippi. Paul showed up in the city of Philippi, and uh, he went out and he followed his normal process. And one of the first people that he meets is a lady by the name of Lydia. And Lydia was a rich businesswoman, which was kind of rare at those times, but she was a rich businesswoman. She was a seller of purple. She had a big house. She had servants. Paul actually went and even stayed with her while he was in the city of Philippi. He was taken care of very well. And that's one of the first people that gets saved and come to know the Lord as their Savior. So you got a rich businesswoman in this church. Then the next person that he meets as you go through that chapter in the book of Acts is a crazy, demon-possessed slave girl. And this girl was a fortune teller, and she made her masters a whole lot of money. They would come up, and the, through the spirits, I mean, she was able to, to tell a lot of things that actually happened and came to pass, or whatever the case may be. She made her owners a lot of money, and Paul tells her about Jesus, and guess what happens? She gets saved. She gets gloriously saved. She gets set free. She's in her right mind. People aren't making money off of her anymore. And so now they get mad, her owners, and they stir up the town. And they get mad and they come get Paul and Silas and they beat him and they throw him into jail. And there he is in a jail cell late at night. Man, it's midnight. And you know what Paul's doing? He's complaining. He's just like, I can't believe I serve the Lord. And he puts me in prison. He beats me up. This is ridiculous. Anybody believe that? Okay, no, that's not what he's doing. They're singing and praising God. The earthquakes, the prison doors are open. Their chains fall off. Everybody's free to go. Somehow Paul and Silas convince everybody to stay. The jailer comes in. He's about to fall on his own sword and take his life because if his prisoners are gone and escaped, his life is over anyway. And Paul yells out, stop. Everybody's here. And the jailer says, sirs. What must I do to be saved? And he gets saved, and his whole household gets saved. And that's how the church at Philippi begins. A rich businesswoman, a crazy demon-possessed slave girl, and a blue-collar jailer. That's how it all starts. How many of you agree those are some pretty big differences? These people don't do life together. They wouldn't be seen out on the streets together. There's nothing that they had in common except for Jesus Christ. Oh, the Bible tells us about a lot of other even bigger, greater differences. Man, it talks a lot about the Jew and Gentile divide. How many of you think there was some serious racial issues in the early church? Imagine it this way today. Imagine the Jews and the Palestinians are at war. Imagine some of the Jewish people put their faith in Jesus and get saved. And some Palestinian people put their faith and trust in Jesus and they get saved. And just imagine, and there might even be a church in Israel today that has Jews and Palestinians in it together. And they are now one body of Christ. That's miraculous and glorious. But how many of you agree that there could be some really hard resentments to get over there? I mean, you had slave and free. Slavery was a, a big deal back in the Bible times. And you had slaves that got converted and their masters that got converted and they're all going to church together and they're all one in Christ and you had male and female and there was great divides back then too. All I'm saying is there are many differences inside of the church. And then to top that all off, if that's not complicated enough, all members have not the same office. Not everybody has the same gifts. Not everybody has the same abilities. You know what else in the church? Not everybody thinks alike. I know that might surprise you. This might blow your mind. But sitting in here is a whole group of people that think differently. And it feels like sometimes it's almost impossible to get anybody thinking the same exact way. Because that's what we do. We think differently on just about everything. And guess what we even have today to complicate matters even more? We have social media where we can blast our opinions and our thoughts out there for the whole world to see How many of you agree that there are big differences inside of the church? All right, so here's what I want you to do. Look back at that same person and say, you're different than me. Go ahead, tell them, man. Now look at him and say, like, no, seriously, like, you really are different than me, man. (laughs) 
here's the thing. That's exactly how God designed it to be. Because where there's big differences, there can also be big glory. Where there are big differences, there can be big glory. One of the things that he says in those two verses, he says, we being many are one body. And this is exactly the way that Jesus designed it. On the night that he was betrayed, the night before he died on the cross, he told his disciples, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. One of the biggest ways that we show the world who God is is the way that we love and the way that we interact and the way that we do life together and the way that all of these differences combine and they blend into one body that is united around Jesus Christ and the gospel of Christ and the truth that is in his word. And can I tell you this morning, just imagine, just imagine if the church can pull this off. Just imagine if all of those Lego pieces can be turned into a masterpiece like this right here. How many of you like this Lego church right here? I didn't have anything to do with this Lego church. You know our amazing pianist up here, Mike Wapplehurst. He happens to be a very creative guy. And he and his sons, Caden and Ethan, built this church for me because when I was thinking about Legos in a church, there's not like really church Lego sets out there. So I said, Mike, I know you like Legos. He's an adult. He loves Legos still. <laughs> I'm not trying to throw you under the bus like that, Mike, wherever you are, okay? But anyway, he built this church right here, and all of those different pieces come together. And man, look at how beautiful. And look at the harmony that exists in something like that right there. Can I challenge you to do something this morning? Will you pray for this? Will you genuinely, truly pray that God will make our church diverse? I, I, I pray for that. I've been praying for this since the day that I became the pastor. I've been praying for it before that. I, I heard something or read something a long time ago. You know, if, if your community is 10% African American or if it's 8% Latino or whatever the case may be, you know what your church should be? Your church should be a reflection of the community. So if our community is 10%, we should have a church that has 10% African American. I mean, it should just be a reflection of the community that where you should live. You should not come to church and look at people that think like you and dress like you and act like you. I mean, God help us if that's the case. There's not a lot of diversity there. It should be bigger than that and more than that. The church should be filled with every type of person that you can imagine that exists inside of the community. People that are saved, people that are transformed by the amazing and grace of God. And yes, it might be complicated. And yes, it might not be pretty at times. And yes, there may be things that happen or people that say things that you're like, whoa, or things that happen that you might not always fully agree with or might not be your favorite thing under the sun. But if people are getting saved and if lives are being transformed and if the truth of God is faithfully being preached and if the name of Jesus is being lifted on high, get on board. Get excited about what God's doing. And by the way, too, I say this with all sincerity, too. If that's not here, then go find a place where you can. Because the church needs people that love God and love others and that are fully bought in to the mission and what's happening, what's taking place. So think big. Man, big differences, big glory. And last but not least, think others. Think others. Look at verse 6. It says this, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. How many of you believe that grace is amazing? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Man, grace is amazing because it's so diverse. It comes in so many different shapes and sizes. Grace is absolutely beautiful. What's interesting about this verse here is that the word for gift, the word for gift in Greek is charisma. And the word for grace is charis. So the gift, the charisma, is a direct result of the grace. So just like the grace of God that saved us benefits us by adopting us into his family and making no more condemnation and making us join heirs with Jesus Christ, all the benefits and the gifts that come along with grace, that same grace that saved us also benefits us, also favors us with gifts 
that we can use in his service. So the grace that you received is not just so that you can keep it for yourself, but so that it can flow through you and it can come out of you in gifts that can be used for the benefit of others. Now, before I get into the gifts and the really practical conclusion that we're going to have on this, I just want to say a few things. Number one, the gifts are alive because grace is alive. Now, if you, start, if you were to go and Google spiritual gifts, you might get confused just a little bit because here's one big question. How many spiritual gifts are they and what are they? If you go Google it, on the very first page, you're going to come up with things like this. What are the 22 spiritual gifts? What are the 21 spiritual gifts? What are the seven spiritual gifts? I clicked on one article, and it said, the New Testament lists 21 spiritual gifts, but Bible scholars agree on 18, and one guy came up with 27. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> now, here's, why do I bring this up? Does God want us to be confused about our gifts? No, not at all. Listen, The grace of God is alive and the gifts of God are alive and they're moving and they show up in different shapes and sizes. And the point isn't that you get a hold of one gift and there it's got its box and its parameters and that's what you are for the rest of your life. No, gifts are alive and they come to you in different ways at different times in your life. Sometimes you get a little bit more of the mercy of God that's being poured out on you and then that gift of mercy is able to be used. And sometimes maybe you're just in a period where you're just really serving. The point is, this be sensitive to the Holy Spirit keep your eyes on Christ and he will reveal and show you how he's moving and how he's working and how he wants to take that and use it in the lives of others so your gifts are alive your gift is a gift your gift is a gift don't be a religious hypocrite how many of you would agree that hypocrites have done a lot of harm to the church There's a lot of people, I I can't tell you how many people I talk to outside of these walls, people that might not be sitting here today that say they never want to go back to church because the church is filled with hypocrites. And I'll just, the church is filled with sinners, okay? We all are. And we, we got to not put our expectations in people. We need to put our expectations in Christ and we need to follow biblical principles on how to deal with imperfect human sinners. And if we do that, we'll be okay. But here's, here's the whole point of this. Your gift is a gift, Don't just serve out of duty. Don't just get up one day and just be like, okay, I know I'm supposed to serve. And I know I'm supposed to live for others. So I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to press forward. And I'm just going to do what I'm supposed to do. I don't feel like it today. I don't want to do it today. And sometimes that may be the case. But if all you're doing is serving out of duty, you're not fooling anybody. People are going to be able to see right through that. Don't put all of your energy and effort into doing Put your energy and effort into receiving the grace of God. Receive it in your life. Let it wash over your life. And then let that naturally flow out in service to others. It won't feel like work. It won't feel like labor all the time if that's the case. Let God energize you. Your gift is a gift. And last, this is just simple. Your gift is fruitful, okay? Here's the deal. Your gift ought to be a benefit to others. If you think that your gift is singing, and I'm not thinking of anybody in particular, so I can say this freely, but if you think that your gift is singing, but it hurts the ears of everybody that's listening to it, it might not be your gift. If you think that your gift is teaching, but everybody is sound asleep while you're teaching, it might not be your gift. Your gift is meant to be fruitful. Your gift is meant to abound. And you know what we have to do? We have to not think highly of ourselves got to think appropriately. We ought to let other people speak into our lives and help us as we go throughout that process of trying to develop and find out where, where God truly has gifted us and not try to like choose what we want it to be, but allow God to work in us and through us in those types of ways. So here's the practical applications and we're done. Know your gift. Know your gift. All right, we're going to go through this. We're going to talk about these gifts. I want you to listen. I'm going to go quickly but slowly if that makes any sense, Okay. <laughs> So we're just going to, there's a list, and we're just going to talk about them and hit them, and then we're going to wrap all of this up, all right? So look at verse 6. It says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether, what's the next word? Prophecy. Let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Prophecy might be the only tricky one in here that we're going to look at. Everything else is just practical, and it's going to make sense. But did you know that the early church relied heavily on prophets? And it was a true gift that God gave. He, before the word of God was completed, the early church needed to know 
how to function and what to do. And so God spoke through the Holy Spirit to prophets and he would declare his divine will and a prophet would then take the message that God gave to them. They would stand up and they would speak it. But just so you don't think it was something that was crazy, it also had to be judged by two or three other prophets so that some person couldn't just stand up there and say, I had a vision of God this morning that I need to share with you. It had to be bounced off of two or three other prophets, so that way it all aligned with what had already been revealed about God and what would make true sense in his word, because God doesn't leave us alone to try to guess at life and to figure it out. So that's how prophets were used early. But many understand the gift of prophecy today as the gift of preaching. It would be the the exposition and application of God's word. Prophecy was profitable to all because it's how does God want us to live? What is his divine will? How are we supposed to live? And so preaching does that today. Preaching is the exposition and the application of God's word. This is God's divine will. And how many of you believe we need preachers today that have the gift that are able to stand up and say, this is the divine will of God. This is how he wants you to live. This is what it looks like for your daily life today. That's a gift of prophecy. That's how it's used in our world. Next is... All right, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portion of faith, verse 7, or what's the next word? Ministry. Let us wait on our ministering to. Ministry is serving. This is selflessly meeting practical needs in the church. How many of you believe that the church needs a whole bunch of servants? Okay, so that's what this is. It's the gift of serving. And then next you have, it says, or he that teacheth. On teaching. Teaching is the ability to help others learn, understand, and grow in their faith. The ability to help others learn, understand, and grow in their faith. I read this while I was studying. Someone said it's arguably the most needed gift in the worldwide church today. I think there's a lot of truth in that. You may not realize it, but all around the world, man, there are huge revivals that are taking place in China. There are huge revivals that are taking place in Latin America. People are being saved. But if they don't have someone to teach them the word of God and how to learn and grow in their faith and what this means to them, they're going to get swept up in false doctrine. People are being saved here at West Florida Baptist Church. We need teachers that can help people understand the truth of God's word so that they don't get swept up in false doctrine so that they grow and learn and understand what God wants. Then the next gift is um, verse 8 at the beginning. It says, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. Exhortation is this, encouraging, comforting, consoling, building one another up. How many of you like those people that are encouraging? How many of you like those people that are comforting? Man, don't you often run to those people? Those are the people that typically have a lot of friends because you feel good after you've been in their presence. You feel like a better person because of the encouragement that comes along. Man, it's a valuable gift. Then there's the gift of giving. That is the ability to give generously and cheerfully. Often contributing resources for the benefit of the church and for those in need, okay? So there's the gift of giving. You contribute to the needs of the church. You contribute to the needs of others, then you have the gift of ruling, which is leading. Okay, that's what, what, what rulers are. It's the gift of leadership. It's providing leadership, organization, and guidance within the church. All right, we, we have a mission to love God and love others, but we need people that can help us organize that mission and administrate that mission so that way we can be most effective, so that way we don't waste time, so that way we can reach people. All right, and then you have mercy. Another one that's listed here. Mercy is showing empathy, compassion, kindness to those who are suffering and in need. Man, I I like being around people that have the gift of mercy too, okay, that are just, they got that empathy, they've got that compassion. Man, when they see a need, man, they instantly, they even tear up, they feel it, they put themselves in that type of a situation. So the practical application on this right here is know your gift. All right, now, did you notice that all of these gifts are just ordinary Christian virtues. As we went through all of them, they're all things that God commands all Christians to do. Like, for instance, if if I have the gift of exhortation or if I have the gift of preaching or whatever it may be, okay, if that's my gift, does that mean I don't have to serve, give, or do any of those other things? Not exactly. Those are all things that God wants all of us to do in our lives. So how do you know what your gifts are? Well, some of these gifts come easier 
more naturally and more joyfully than other gifts. So are you ready? This is really deep. The things that you enjoy doing, the things that come more natural to you, the things that produce fruit in you and from your life, more than likely that is the spiritual gift that God has given to you. I don't think it's super complicated, man. If you have a heart that is moved with compassion for those that are in need, then be merciful and do it through the proportion of faith. Do it according to the measure of mercy that God pours out on you. If you are a giver, God bless you, then give according to that measure of faith that he pours out on you and let him use you in supernatural ways for his honor and for his glory. And so that's where we all conclude with this. Use your gifts. Use your gifts. We are better together. Hey, this is about as practical, all of Romans chapter 12, is about as practical as you can possibly get. I'm glad that you're here this morning. I seriously am. I am genuinely happy that every single person is sitting here this morning. But can I tell you honestly from the bottom of my heart, if you really want to grow in your faith, and if you want that measure of faith to increase, you got to do more than just show up and attend church on Sunday. You've got to take next steps. And when you do, God will begin to open up doors. He'll begin to grow you. He'll begin to stretch you in ways that are just phenomenal and unbelievable. He's given you talents and abilities that he wants to use for something larger than life, something greater than yourself. Do you understand that there are people that are lost and dying and on their way to hell? And the reason we exist as a church is to point people to Jesus Christ. You've got to use your gifts. Mike brought me some of these pieces too. So these right here are some of the foundation pieces. You'll notice there's gray, the darker grays at the bottom that build the foundation. I think some of the foundation pieces in the church are preaching and teaching. I mean, the foundation of growth is the word of God. And we've got to understand the word of God. We've got to know what the divine will of God is. Can I say, some of you might be sitting in here thinking this morning, oh, i got a free pass because when I think about being a preacher of God's word, it doesn't necessarily bring a lot of joy and delight to me. And can I tell you, I was there for a long time as a teenager. I knew God wanted me to preach, but I was like, I don't want to do that. That's for somebody else. Can I tell you? There are, probably, there are people in here, I believe with all my heart, there might be a young man in here right now that God wants you, that he's gifted you, and he wants you to surrender to that call, which is your reasonable service. Don't fight God. You know what? I, the fact is, I don't think the call goes out to people to surrender their lives to full-time ministry like it used to. When I, was in, when I was in Bible college, our ministerial class was well in the 400s. It's like half of that today. So I want to just, I, through the Holy Spirit, let him work in your heart. If God's calling you, if he's gifted you, if he's enabling you, if you're sitting there right now listening, saying, maybe that is what he wants me to do, and I could get excited about doing this, then listen and surrender and give your life to God. This world needs people that will stand up and truly declare what God's word says. And man, we need teachers. We have dozens of teachers today that are going to be teaching to children, that are going to be teaching in connect groups tonight. People that just God's given a special gift and ability to take the word of God, open it up, help connect the dots in people's lives. Foundation pieces. You know what's awesome about this? It's not just one piece. They're interlocked. They're interconnected. They're part of something bigger and greater. Then we got the walls here. The walls aren't always the most exciting part of a church, but you know what represents the walls, I think, Serving and giving. Serving and giving. There's no church. There's no structure. There's no living body without the walls that make that up. And you know what I am thankful for? I am thankful for the generous, sacrificial givers that God's given to this church. And by the way, all of us have a part in that. But some of you are, are especially gifted in those areas. According to the measure of faith that God's given to you, give. Give cheerfully. Give with your whole heart. Let it be used in furthering the work. Serve. There are, liter there are over 100 people that serve in our church every Sunday, from first impressions to children's ministry to singing in the choir to working in our live stream and cameras and different things like that. Come and serve with your heart. You know what energizes me? People that are here every single week, and I know that they're excited to be here, and I know that, that they wouldn't be rather doing anything else in the world, and they're happy to be behind the scenes. They're happy that nobody knows their name. They're just happy to play a part in the work that God is doing. If that's the gift that he's given you, do it. Man, it'll encourage others. And then you got this piece right here, which is 
a support piece. I think these are the leaders. This church needs leaders. This church needs people that are skilled in administration and that are able to bring others together and get them excited about the work that God's going to do. And it supports and it upholds the structure and the frame. And then I got this piece right here. Does anybody want to take a guess at what this, this piece is right here? It's part of the roof. I would have never guessed it. I would have said it's actually the real base, the foundation, but it's actually part of the roof. And you know what's great about the roof? When you're building a house and you put up the walls and all the side structures, until those trusses go on and until the plywood goes down, once all of that happens, man, it holds it in place. And you know what the church needs? Exhorters and encouragers. It needs those people that go around and are like, hey, I see what you're doing. Keep up the good work. And when people are broken and when people are down and life's tough, they're coming along and they're giving hugs and they're sending texts and they get down in the ditch and they do life. And they're like, hey, I'm right here with you. God's got some things he's going to do and it might take a while, but I'm going to help you all the way through. Those are the kind of people that hold the whole structure and bring it all together. And then you got the door. And that's mercy, and that's compassion. What attracted you to Christ? It was the mercies of God that brought you to Christ. And you know what's going to attract the lost world to Jesus? People that are filled with mercy and compassion. People that look at others, and they see their differences, and they're like, I'm glad you're different. I couldn't be more excited that you're so different than me because we get to grow in grace together and I'm gonna love you the way that you are and I'm gonna try to understand who you are and why you think the way that you do and we're gonna grow in the grace and knowledge and mercy of God together. Do you understand all of these things flow together and make up the incredible body of Christ? Use your gifts. The invitation this morning is gonna be really simple. We're about to come and sing in just a minute worthy of it all because he is right day and night night and day every day we get up we die to ourselves and I'm sprinkling out these pieces of Legos and we're going to stand up and I'm going to pray they're going to play I want you to come down and I want you to grab one please pick them up so no one trips on them and gets hurt (laughs) that's why I waited till the end to do that because I didn't want anyone tripping and falling all over them But I want you to come down this morning. I want you just to grab a piece of Lego. And they're all different shapes and sizes, just like every single person that's in here. As a reminder that God has created you exactly who you are. He's given you a gift that he wants you to use in his service. And think through that list. Go through that list and meditate on it this week. What is it? Is it giving? Is it serving? Is it exhorting? Is it preaching? Is it teaching? And take a next step. Take a next step. Man, we'll give you a practical way to do that. Like when our service is over, we're going to say, go to the next steps wall. And we're going to ask you to fill out a card that's right in the desk, right in the seats in front of you. And guess what? On that card, it says next steps. If you're not serving right now and you want to take a step, write write down an area where you want to get involved in. Maybe write down one of those gifts that we talked about that really resonated with you. But let God move and work in your heart. We are a part of something great and incredible. Get on board. Get involved. There's nothing more exciting than being a part of what God's doing in this world.